Uh, we have reached the end of the seventh chapter of the book of Romans in our sermon series, and it's a crescendo of sorts. And one of the most moving passages in the New Testament, as the great apostle Paul offers a cry of anguish and bears his soul for us. Uh, our text will be Romans chapter 7. I'll be reading verses 7 to, through 25. And per usual, I will work through it a few verses at a time. But why don't we begin by asking God to help us understand what these words of Scripture mean for us right now. Let's pray together. So Lord, thank you for these words of life, these living words. May they find a place within us to continue your work of making us new, of transforming us into your image that we might reflect you wherever we go today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. One writer described this week in our nation as the aftermath of a woe following a trauma in the context of a tragedy. All I know is that this week's events wrote the sermon for me. I couldn't make up a fictional story that would be a more perfect illustration for our text than what happened in our country this week. The sinful corruption of the human heart and the detritus of the human soul was spilling out everywhere. It's gross. I can only be on social media for so long before I begin to feel sick. It's so full of hateful, judgmental, angry, prejudicial, and unkind words. As a result, the words of Jesus have been ringing in my ears. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of our mouths reveals the contents of our souls. Whether we like it or not, the condition of our soul is on full display every day by the words we speak. It spills out of our mouths. Paul's written about 5,000 words so far in our English translations in this book to say one thing, <laughs> that we are all utterly and incurably sinful and in desperate need of God's grace. That's the only thing that can save us. Do you remember who picked up that message of grace and ran with it in ways that revolutionized the church? It was Martin Luther, the great Protestant theologian and reformer. I grew up Lutheran, so he was quite revered in our church. I had my first crisis of faith in college when I read Luther's treatise entitled On the Jews and Their Lies. Let me give you a sampling of his proposal to the church about what the church should do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews. First, he says, first, set fire to their synagogues and schools. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom 
so that God might see that we are Christians. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught be taken from them. Fourth, I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews, for they have no business in the countryside. Six, I propose that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them. Finally, seventh, I recommend putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle into the hands of young, strong Jews and Jewesses and let them earn their bread in the sweat of their brow. In other words, enslave them. But if we are afraid that they might harm us or our wives, children, servants, cattle, then let us emulate the common sense of other nations, such as France and Spain, Bohemia, then eject them forever from the country. That's the leader of the Protestant Reformation. After all these years, I still don't quite know what to think about Martin Luther. But I can tell you why our world is in this crisis. Because hatred haunts the back alleys of all of our hearts, no matter who we are. And as far as I know, the only cure to the disease of human hatred is a new heart filled with God's love. That's essentially what Paul has been saying for seven chapters now. In his terrific article entitled, A Nation on Fire Needs the Flames of the Spirit, which was printed in Christianity Today this week, author Esau Macaulay wrote this, and I'll quote him here. He wrote, black Christians can deal with people who have no reason to support us. We can deal with secular racists. What is heartbreaking and exhausting is to find ourselves fighting for our right to exist and then find that the enemy is our brother in Christ. As the Psalms say, it is not enemies who taught me. I could bear that. But it's you, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend with whom I kept pleasant company we walked in the house of God together. He writes, the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to have a unified message for our country and our world that there is a God whose love is powerful enough to gather all the divided peoples of the world even when all the politicians and philosophers fail. And there's a God of justice who sees and acts on behalf of all the beleaguered peoples of the world. That is our message. Okay, maybe we should read our passage. I know that was a long introduction. Don't get scared. I'll keep my comments brief. Let's begin with verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was 
had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. This is the word of the Lord. So quite typically, Paul begins with a question, which is, is God's loving guidance for his beloved children sinful? His answer is, of course not. It simply establishes the boundaries of right and wrong, but don't blame the law. His answer reminded me of the days when my kids were young and they played house basketball. I'm sure many of you had the same experience of surprise that I did when the referees didn't call the players for traveling. I remember it must have been kindergarten, probably first and second grade, they just run up and down the court without dribbling. (laughs) And the referee would never blow the whistle because they weren't violating any rule. And then in third grade, it became a rule. (laughs) And suddenly they learned what traveling was. I was thinking it was cute when they were six, but it wouldn't be very cute at 16 if they ran up and down the court in a varsity game carrying the ball. Paul said, we wouldn't have known what sin was until the law showed up and blew the whistle on us, gave us direction to protect us, but also it exposed us. Okay, let's keep reading. I'll read verses 8 to 14 now. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment, put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So Paul says to us this morning, here's the strange reality that we all need to reckon with. That we will always be tempted by the forbidden things. The rabbis taught that Adam lived in innocence until he was given a command not to touch something. And then, of course, that's what he wanted. Because the law stirs up sin within us. The pattern throughout Scripture, beginning in Eden, has always been innocent command, sin, and death. But again, Paul says, don't blame the law for revealing God's will. It's not the law's fault that we sin, it's our sinful nature. The law, he says, is holy and it's righteous and good. In fact, if we kept it perfectly, we'd be in perfect relationship with God and our neighbors. Okay, let's keep reading. Verses 15 to 23. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is 
in my sinful nature. For I desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. This is Paul's most graphic and dark portrait of the human condition where we are controlled and manipulated by our sin like a marionette. He cannot do, he says, what he wants to do when he can't stop doing what he doesn't want to do. He says, I desire to do what's good, but I can't seem to do it. I really want to do good, and I, I actually do delight in God's word and his law, but something else inside me is waging war against the law of my mind and make me a prisoner of sin. Can anybody relate to this? Paul says in Galatians 5.17 that our lives are the battleground of this conflict. He writes, for the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. I really appreciate Paul's honesty in this text. And he finally cries out in anguish in verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? So Paul is expressing the painful reality that our bodily condition hasn't yet caught up with who we now are in Christ. That we've been justified, so we wake up every day forgiven and perfectly righteous in the sight of God. Thanks be to God. But as long as we live in these bodies of clay, not yet glorified, the contest within us will rage on and on and we will live in that tension. That's what it means to be fleshly. Well, Paul ends this chapter with a teaser. What's finally coming? Finally, in chapter 8, verse 25, he writes, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Christ's victory on the cross means we've been made free from all the guilt and shame and the burden of our sin, but it also means something else. It means that reinforcements have been sent to us to fight the battle against sin. The Holy Spirit has been sent to empower us to stand and fight, but also to transform our hearts and minds and restore the image of Christ in us so we can be made whole and holy, so we can begin to experience more wins than losses in our battle against sin, so we don't spend our journey of faith stuck on the Mendoza line. And our role is quite simple. We give ourselves daily to the one who can fill us with his life and his love and transform us from people of hatred, anger, lust, deceit, pride, and all kinds of darkness to people of love and kindness and goodness and humility and faith and light. 
I recently came to the conclusion that the great mystery of my life is that I don't always pursue God with all my heart and mind and soul and strength. And if God is who we say he is, then my response to him is quite pathetic. But this may also be the strongest evidence of what we are up against. That the flesh pulls us and tugs us daily towards self-centered living and the spirit is at the same time calling us to live selflessly for him and others. Right, let me finish with this. When we were living in Asheville, North Carolina, we would drive downtown to exercise at the YMCA. At the time, Elliot was very young, so we would drop him off in the childcare room. And one day, uh, we picked him up after our workouts, and then for some reason, we stopped by the front desk, and we must have been chatting too much because a few minutes later, we noticed that he was missing. I'm thinking he was around two years old at the time. So as you can imagine, panic mode kicked in right away as we started searching for him throughout the building. When we finally located him, I'll never forget that I heard him before I saw him. <laughs> I could hear him laughing. He was belly laughing, cackling. We found him in the gym. <laughs> he was sitting on the gym floor rolling a ball. Across from him, sitting on the gym floor, was a black man. To Elliot, he was just a man rolling a ball across the floor to him. He wasn't black. He was just a kind man with a ball. Restore us, O oh Lord, to the way it was supposed to be by your spirit through your church for your glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. Lord, by your spirit, continue that work in us of setting us free from the bondage of our sin and making us new people that reflect your image in the way we love and give and live, we pray in your name, amen.